knight to f6. And instead of exchanging, Polgar plays the sharpest move, knight to g5, threatening f7, of course. So pawn comes to e6, now queen e2. Well, there's some wicked tactics going on here. The knight can't be kicked immediately, because if h6, for instance, knight takes pawn, f7, an old trick. King takes knight, queen takes pawn. But that was met by another bit of razzle-dazzle. The knight takes queen, and it's all over. For many of us, it's hard to imagine classrooms beyond the bounds of four walls. But for one pioneering woman, the answer was simple. Go beyond classroom walls and into chessboards. Today, we speak to none other than Judith Polgar herself, regarded as one of the strongest chess players in history. Judith Polgar is passionate about seeing chess taught in every elementary school worldwide. At the age of just 15, Judith became the youngest to achieve the title of Grandmaster in Chess, breaking the record previously held by former world champion Bobby Fischer. She then won endless other titles, becoming the only female chess player to make it to the top 10 in the men's open world rankings. But her achievements don't end there. In 2012, she spearheaded and developed a new and unique educational method. Her approach goes beyond the usual boundaries of teaching chess, and she believes that with the right tools, access, and education, anyone can have the tools to become a champion of their lives. I'm Tariq al and this is People and Planet, a podcast from Expo 2020 Dubai's program for People and Planet, where changemakers from all over the world break down what it will take to create a sustainable future for our planet. An important and vital topic to inspire other people to take this action. journey through space and time. An extension of our natural wealth. Brings us together in so many different ways. Optimize women's contribution to security to build a brighter tomorrow. During Knowledge and Learning Week at Expo 2020 Dubai, Pulgar discussed the role of chess and gamification in creating a conducive system to help kids learn better academically, but also in their everyday lives. So to get started, Judith, you are a chess grandmaster. You're an educator. Your native language is chess. You are an attacker of kings and a global champion for gender equality. Your life is a testament to the power of positive parenting. And as a passionate tactician of patterns, your patterns are now also forever immortalized in the digital world to your first NFT, uh, which commemorates the first time in any sport, the number one woman beat the number one man. Judith Polgar, welcome. It's an honor to be able to speak to you today. Thank you. And would like to start with, could you please just introduce yourself and what your current life's mission is for our audience? Uh, Well, nowadays uh, I retired in 2014 from competitive chess and uh, I established my foundation, the Judith Polgar Chess Foundations, in 2012. I do have a Judith Polgar method developed by my foundation where uh, in Hungary from 2013 we are... uh, providing a, a program for school children for elementary school and uh, we are using chess as an educational tool we do have this program also implemented for uh, preschoolers and uh, the foundation is focusing on this educational uh, method how to use chess uh, for kids that they can use in everyday life so that they gain skills what they can use in everyday life And, uh, well, I do professional commentary, like here at the Expo, I was here because of the World Championship match was taking place, and I was the expert in one of the channels. I do a lot of uh, inspiration uh, uh, lectures and uh, many other activities. 
there are many cultures where simply kids don't dare to make mistakes. And you can see in different cultures where they inspire people to make mistakes because that's the only way you can learn from your mistakes and be better from day to day, right? And this is, I think, something uh, uh, exceptionally important, that in a game, it's not stressful. Many kids are so, they have so much anxiety, they have so much stress, and it blocks their brain. When you play, you open up. You say, I'm open to learning, I'm open to playing, I'm open to improve. And we'd also like to start where it began, in 1976, uh, where you're born in, in Budapest, Hungary. Your entire family played chess, including your older siblings. And your, you and your siblings' childhood has sometimes been described as a beautiful experiment. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how your experience was shaped growing up in Hungary at the time, and also what that experiment was, uh, particularly in the environment that your parents raised you in. Basically, my father, when uh, he met my mom and they were dating, already then he had the idea that uh, when he's going to be having children, a family, then he would like to specialize them uh, to a specific field. And then when later on my parents got married and uh, I was number three in the family who was born after my sisters. Uh, my sister Susan, who is the first one, uh, she found the chess set in, the, in a box. And my father was a passionate amateur chess player. And at the age of uh, four, uh, they decided that chess will be uh, something that they will specialize on my sister. And of course, when seven years later I was born, it was uh, very natural already for me. So chess was already in the family. That language was spoken by both of my sisters, Susan and Sophia. And it was somehow very natural the way I grew up into this family. Uh, my parents had already the experience with my two older sisters. That's how I started uh, the game, which meant also that uh, I was not going to school, but I was uh, homeschooled due to after that. Uh, in the beginning, of course, it was only 10 minutes. Then later on, it increased. So by the time I was eight, nine years old, I was uh, playing chess daily, six, seven, eight hours. Oh, wow. And... Do you remember the first time you actually received your own chessboard or chess set? Uh, do you remember that moment and when it happened that it was there for your own, not your, not your sister's? I remember the first kind of uh, tournament memory when I was about uh, six years old and uh, I won a block of the area where we live. That's where I won the first tournament and then I received a very small pocket chess set. Okay. And, and your sisters also became chess champions in their own right, correct? We, the three of us and the one other Hungarian girl, we won twice the chess Olympiad for uh, Hungary. And uh, Susan, the, my older sister, she became the women's world champion in 96 as well. Uh, my other sister uh, became a woman grandmaster, international master in the open section. Oh, amazing. And how did that affect the family dynamics? Uh, what was that like and that competitive spirit back home as well? Actually, it was very interesting because looking it back, uh, my family was like a startup company where the parents decided what, what is going to be the topic, what is going to be the field which we are going to picking up and do. And then uh, everybody was for each other. So one for all, all for one kind of attitude was uh, the living lifestyle of the family. And as it was not accepted in Hungary, the generally speaking at that time, it was not very common at all that you're homeschooled and you don't visit school daily basis. It was not normal. So it was uh, pretty lot of uh, difficulties for my parents from that. Also, the Hungarian Federation was not very much supportive on the fact that as girls, we wanted to play in the open section and not competing in the ladies competitions. So this gave a lot of difficulty for my parents to raise us the way they were thinking is the best for us. And uh, this is why I think because of this very strong opposition to my family, the way they raised 
this is why it was very easy for us not uh, having rivalry in the family. We were really very supportive and very happy for each other's success. At the age of 12, when I was uh, winning the first time the Olympic gold medal together with my sisters, I was performing the best player of the whole Olympiad. And up to that point, we were traveling uh, mostly together, the family. Susan, the older sister of mine, she was uh, playing in, let's say, A group, the more professional group, the highest level. And I was playing and my sister Sophia on the lower uh, groups. When will there be a woman world champion? Well, maybe she's sitting next to me. (laughs) But somehow then I took over. I also became number one in the world uh, women uh, rankings. And after that, it was kind of difficult uh, moment for me because our uh, roads uh, deviated uh, from each other. And I went to one kind of tournament or an invitational event. And my other sisters were going to other events which was uh, quite a difficult period for me because we are so used to traveling together, being the best friends with my sisters. And then uh, I was starting to go on different routes to improve my chest as much as possible. At what age were you conscious that you were living a childhood that was not quite as others in your community or society. Like, when was that something that was very conscious to you? Uh, Yeah, I was probably around six, seven, when uh, it was clear and understood that I'm not living a, a regular life as other kids do. So it was very clear that uh, we have a very unusual life, me and my family. It was not difficult to recognize and feel it. I learned the game when I was five, so I was growing up in a game which gave me everything in my life because I was able to travel around the world and know so many cultures and many depths in it. It's just you learn rules, you learn how to be flexible, you learn how to handle loss, you learn how to take victory, how to debate, how to prepare, how to challenge yourself. By that time, my sister Susan was already a pretty good competitive uh, player, and I was joining with her and the family to chess tournaments. I was, I think, around 12 when uh, I was part of the Olympic champion team. That was clearly the time and around that, that uh, it was not a question that uh, I will not go to university, but I will continue to reach as high as possible in the, in chess. And that route led you to a legacy that we can't even describe. Uh, Indeed, one of the best chess players of all time. And I wonder in that path and that road and that legacy, what would you describe as the defining win of your life? Well, the road was uh, long, of course. My career lasted, my professional career and competitive career for 33 years before I retired. A milestone was clearly when I became the youngest grandmaster breaking Bobby Fischer's record, as that was the moment when uh, at the same time with this event where I performed this, I also became the Hungarian uh, super champion in the men's competition of Hungary. So this was kind of a moment where also in Hungary and also internationally, Uh, It was very clear that I'm heading somewhere much higher than that. Of course, at the same time, still there were a lot of skepticism that, uh, well, she's just 15. In the later time, maybe she's going to have uh, boys in her life. Love will take her focus and so on. So this was, of course, a big journey. Welcome to round four of the American Chess Challenge. Featuring Judith Polgar and Ron Henley. Thanks, Bruce. Hello, everyone. This is Maurice Ashley here with Grandmaster John Fedorovich. This should be an exciting matchup, John. What do you think? Yeah, I think it will be because Judith is a heavy puncher and Ron is more like a counter puncher. So we'll have to see what, what happens here. And then I was competing uh, more and more in on uh, international level. I was uh, moving forward from uh, top 50 to move to top 30. 
And then later on, I could enter into the top 10 in the world when uh, I got married and my husband was uh, actually supporting me uh, very much. He's a sport lover himself and... uh, he joined me to many tournaments, and that was the point. We got married in 2000, and in 2003, I was able to enter into the top 10, and then I stayed there for uh, several years. And uh, I never took the, I never played, so I never could, made it possible to win the world championship title myself for ladies. That's practically the only title I did not take. Uh, because I felt always the way my parents raised me that chess is a sport to think and it's a mental sport uh, so you have to be the best you can and uh, for this reason I was always competing in a more difficult uh, opposition and uh, and and that was the road for me to to show myself to the world that uh, how far you can reach uh, as a woman, as a, as a talented player. And I'm really inspired, I think, just to connect back to that story around you being homeschooled, then the approach that your your parents and your father took as well to provide that supportive environment. And I'd like to shift gears a little bit, and since it's Knowledge and Learning Week at Expo 2020, uh, to speak a little bit about the access to knowledge and learning when it comes to competitive sports such as chess. So you were born into a... Hungarian Jewish family at a time when discrimination was high. Uh, Your own father, who was one of your coaches, had uh, famously said, I believe, geniuses are made, not born, uh, which really illustrates your point uh, to the type of environments that required. And both of your parents were teachers, and it sounds like your dad was talking about knowledge, learning, and perseverance, amongst many other things. And I wonder, could you talk about your own personal experience with access to learning, uh, especially when you're a homeschooled kind of environment and what barriers you faced personally, um, even beyond you learning uh, the game of chess? Well, of course, it was difficult uh, from the point of view that from the outside world, when I met people, they were worried about me, they were skeptical about the lifestyle we live, that how can we grow into normal human beings if you don't go to school, you don't have your daily uh, different subjects uh, to learn. In chess-wise, it was very clear that uh, as I was learning many hours every day, this way you're focusing on something, so you're also improving very fast. And generally speaking, it is with everything that uh, it's one thing that to learn something, to have the knowledge of that, to understand it. And it's a completely different story how you can implement it and convert it into result, whether it's chess or uh, your other knowledge. Generally, when you go to school, when you have any learning that you don't see the fruit of your invested energy and the hours you spend. At the same time, it gives you uh, more motivation and and the perseverance to hang on. And this was given by my parents and my sisters and coaches that no matter uh, whether you don't see the result maybe for months or even a year that you don't see a huge difference in your strengths in the rankings, it's still that you're improving and uh, adding to to your uh, your knowledge, but of course, sport is uh, something that uh, you have to have uh, different skills, and uh, it's not for everybody. For me, it was uh, good that I had a very good character, which was matching the the knowledge and 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 to chess, because uh, I was a very practical player. I was someone who could convert the knowledge into practical game. But of course, there are a lot of different aspects of the game. You learn, uh, you practice, and you try to implement it into reality, into the chess game. But you have to know a lot of psychology to that. You have to be resilient. You have to be able to stand up if you lose. Uh, how to handle victories also. And since I retired from uh, competitive chess, I also see that it's it's an endless story to learn. Uh, many people say that, okay, lifelong learning, I usually try to 
say it in another way, it's a lifelong uh, being curious because if you're curious, then you're continuously learning uh, without pain. <laughs> okay, and you mentioned on your path, uh, you have a very deep commitment to gender equality. Um, you are UN Women's Generation Equality uh, Ambassador. I know it's a topic that's close to your heart and I wonder what was it like perfecting your craft in that kind of environment dominated by men? Uh, and I think I'm also curious as to how you reflect today on do we still have the same structural barriers? Well, chess was always a very much male-dominated sport. I think generally, of course, uh, I get the question all the time that how it can be changed and what is the reason to this? I think uh, mostly or in big part of it is the social expectations from girls and from different segments. It's the parents, the coaches, the teachers, the society simply sees a girl talent in a very different eye from seeing a boy. But unfortunately, this means that uh, if from real life you would uh, you would uh, highlight the talent and the qualities of a talent, talented seven-year-old girl, that well, you're smart, you're bright, you have all, you can make your PhD whatever you pick. At the same time, to the boy, they would say that you're so smart that one day you're going to be a Nobel Prize winner. But I think it's very important from the parents' point of view also not to limit their daughters that there is a woman role. That is something that you can do to other things you cannot do. And uh, for girls who are already into the game uh, nowadays, I always say that, well, uh, do play chess as a profession, try to get better every day and the best you can be compared to yourself. I was very fortunate when I was very little to learn the game of chess. But until my new dream becomes reality, I like to inspire people, especially youngsters, to dream big. Make good moves in life, set your goals high, and reach the impossible. Thank you. And that really speaks to the, the psychological strength as well and the different kind of mentality as well that you need for modern day chess. And that's, of course, what you're trying to do through the, the engine of the Judith Polgar method. And you spoke a little bit earlier when we started about uh, the Judith Polgar Chess Foundation and your mission to bring educational chess to schools. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on what the Judith Polgar method is and to talk us through what the Chess Foundation uh, aims to do through its two educational programs. Uh, my foundation is focusing on several things. We have two very specific uh, focus. One is generally to promote chess internationally in different uh, ways. We are organizing a yearly global chess festival where we show the connection between science, education, uh, as a sport also. Uh, and of course, we have the other focus, which we are very specifically into it for many years, since 2013, that uh, how chess can develop skills for children, which uh, they can be used in uh, everyday life. You go out from the school and immediately you're using those skills, planning your, your ideas, take the consequences, communication or decision making. And uh, the main idea of that, the chess is a pretty complicated game, as many people say, and it's true if you want to uh, play it and learn it on a very high level. At the same time, it has uh, very nicely... You can split up every segment of it, so you can use it very beautifully in education. The 64 squares, the coordinates, the six different kind of pieces, which is moving in a different way, the 32 pieces on the chessboard, and all six different pieces, characters you have, which move in different way, 
and also it has different values. So, for example, if you pick mathematics, we have the values of the pieces. One is the pawn, value of the knight and bishop is three, rook is five, queen is nine, and actually the king is... is uh, Unvaluable, it's, it's just everything. So you can replace the other numbers with the king. You're taking with the chess piece the pieces and then you make some number uh, uh, mathematical equation in the classroom. It's, of course, very important how can you motivate and inspire the kids to keep themselves interested uh, and uh, motivated into staying curious and learning, uh, seeking information and knowledge. And also the main idea is to push a little bit and add to the engine they have inside of them. We don't inspire kids to be competitive sport people, that they should be masters. It is important in some way to be a winner and to be competitive. But I think, first of all, it's very important that every child should be better every day to compare themselves and not to everybody else. The youngsters cannot develop if somebody is pushing them. It can be pushed in the very beginning, but at a certain point, it's either you yourself, you have this inner motor, that uh, this drive, which uh, pushes you ahead or uh, or you will not uh, excel on the very highest uh, level. So my main strengths, I think, when I, I motivate some of the youngsters that uh, I make them believe that they can do it and it's worth it and, uh, and they should fight for it and be perseverance on whatever they want to reach. Amazing. And uh, on, on a closing note, um, you're known worldwide for your superb tactics, uh, your aggressive and assertive chess playing style, and known for often planning several steps ahead. If you were to plan your next steps in life, like you would a chess game, could you walk us through how that would look like? What would your next moves look like in life? And uh, what is the legacy that you'd actually like to leave on that chessboard? I'm a person generally who lives uh, today in the presence. That's what uh, I was and uh, that's what I believe that that's how you can live uh, the the best life. At the same time, of course, you're making plannings and you have a vision. Uh, how do you visualize yourself or uh, your career or your family in the long run? Uh, sometimes it's not easy to combine these two. Well, generally speaking, uh, if I look at it, my professional way of thinking, of course, I believe that uh, it would be great if I could uh, leave a legacy on uh, how chess became an obvious uh, part of education, like math or, or, uh, or, or science or some of the other uh, parts. So... This is something that I believe that it will get there and uh, I will be happy that I will be uh, considered probably being a contributor to that. Uh, regarding my private life and uh, my family, I'm, I'm always looking for balance, how to manage uh, family matters, health and work, which is uh, practically an impossible mission but uh, as I like challenges I'm always <laughs> challenged by this. Thank you so much Judith for your wise words and thank you for the life you've lived, the life that you continue to live in service and we also hope uh, you find all the balance that you need in every chess piece uh, of your life uh, thank you so much for your time and wisdom today <laughs> Thank you People and Planet is an official podcast of Expo 2020 Dubai, creating a sustainable future for our planet together. Learn more by visiting virtualexpodubai.com or searching Program for People and Planet. People and Planet is produced by Kerning Cultures Network. Episodes are released every second Monday. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you enjoyed the show, share it with your friends and leave us a review.